Uh, our special guest this morning is Christian Perslow, former MD of Liverpool, Chelsea, and most recently chief exec of Aston Villa. And you're telling us, Christian, in the break, you're a big cricket fan and a rugby union fan. I'm a sports nut, Sean, yeah, and um, I'm just, I'm very happy you've got the screen on behind you. So, uh, 190 ahead. Is that enough? I don't know. I mean, I think if this track, the track looked terrible on day one, but it hasn't quite been as bad as everyone assumed. I think if we can get 220, 230, maybe that's enough. We'll see. And you also need to sort out the England Rugby Union team, we've decided as well. I watched that yesterday and I, I was just saying to Henry, I, I, it feels to me we're wonderful at World Cups and much less good in Six Nations games. And, and um, it just didn't look like the team that basically nearly overran South Africa who went on to win the World Cup so I, mm. I I don't know what's gone wrong in the last few months a lot of injuries but still I just don't think we approach the Six Nations in the way we approach the World Cup Anyway in the first uh, quarter of an hour we were talking quite a lot about your experiences at Liverpool um, you went from there after a bit of a break you went to Chelsea uh, where you were sort of a global MD responsible for quite a bit of the sponsorship deals you've gone from what you had at Liverpool to an absolute autocratic leader in Roman Abramovich who was the only person presumably uh, calling the shots what was that experience like? Well as you say it was an incredibly different role um, um, Roman was as you say called all the shots and um, and on on really player recruitment coach recruitment and the football side and um, but a subject, you know, that um, that has become my specialist subject, which is financial regulation, was starting to loom large in 2014 mm. because up until that point, the first 10 years of his ownership period, uh, he had subsidised Chelsea every year with huge amounts of investment to finance losses as he built uh, a very competitive, in fact, a trophy-winning club. But um, as the financial regulations tightened, in 2014, he realised that he needed to replace those monies with proper commercial revenue and asked me to come in and see if I could build a commercial business for Chelsea at that time. And um, that's what I did. Sorry, and did he personally come and ask you? I mean, did you meet him? Did you I met him, him and his... I met, he, 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 he's a very quiet and very private man, but he has, he has a, you know, a group of advisors around him, one of whom I'd known for many years, one of his Russian closest associates I'd known for many years who made the who made the introduction all happened extremely quickly Sean and was initially mm -hmm. going to be you know a relatively brief period because their previous CEO had left at very short notice um, but I ended up staying for three seasons and um, you know it, it's um, having a club that's based in London that that's winning more trophies than any other club is a fairly sellable proposition in my opinion and so uh, I had a lot of fun running around the world selling that proposition to uh, investors. Well, I mean, we could see it at games that he he's a football fan and you could see it at, you know, the, the people at Chelsea would talk about the age group games and he'd sort of pop up and watch an under-19 game at, at Cobham. But what, what were his motives? I mean, it wasn't to make money because he was obviously losing money there. I don't know. I don't know. I can't claim to know him personally at all. Nobody at the club knew him personally. Um, but um, he certainly liked winning. Um, and he certainly did not like coming second, let alone third, God forbid, fourth. Um, so the culture was brutal and the, brute, the culture was win. And everybody in that football club from me downwards knew that if you don't win, you'd be up. If I had been even remotely off, you know, off in my performance, uh, I'd have been out the door in two seconds as a number of coaches were uh, in, in, uh, under his tenure. Um, and not everybody thinks that's the right way to run a football club. And the chopping and changing of coaches came under a lot of scrutiny for the era, but I'm sure many fans sitting here today, Chelsea fans, I should say, in fact, many commentators will note that the the hall of trophies under his ownership was absolutely remarkable. And so he, he kind of rewrote the book. You know, we all grew up, I did, you did, with the view of the world that a, that, a, that a Fergie tenure and a Wenger tenure is the way to do it. And of course it is if it goes well, but he kind of had a different approach, which was almost as successful. And um, most people like stability. He seemed to, he seemed to view that as irrelevant. It was all about results and everybody knew that. Um, I feel like we could have spent two hours with you, Christian, certainly an hour on Chelsea. Um, you said you gave it three years. Why did you walk away from Chelsea? Well, job was job was done. It was a very it was a very um, um, you know everything went to plan. 
things had changed a lot, I think, for uh, for the owner when, um, when, for example, he cancelled the plans to build a new stadium. Mm-hmm. As a businessman, commercial person, that would have been a big part of my brief. But we had sorted out the commercial program. Um, and, um, yeah, there was no, you know, let's be clear, um, I was used to I was used to being, you know, running the whole of a football club. That's where my mm-hmm. natural, um, you know, that's where I would have wanted to be. That was never going to happen at Chelsea. He had his own people around him on the football side. So we, you know, we parted pretty amicably and um, and off I went. Would Chelsea have got involved in the European Super League if you'd still been there? It wouldn't have been my decision, Henry. Um, yeah, but what would your opinion have been? That's a that's a better question. Um, <laughs> I think um look I think as a as a as a club of that magnitude it's easy it's easy to you know that 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 is a game changing proposition for an owner in fact in fact for any of the owners of those clubs to sit and say on a point of principle we're not going to join this league which uh if we're left out of and if it happens could could literally um, sentence us to a life of irrelevance at the elite end of European mm. football that we're used to. So I don't judge uh, owners in that situation too harshly. Um, one of the reasons I'm very happy to be here chattering to you today is that it's easy for me to be able to tell you what my personal views are on these subjects, who's someone who's an English football fan at heart, who utterly fortuitously got a chance to work in football for the last 20 years um but that would be different uh, if i'm employed by a club whose shareholders and the value of their shareholding hinges on some of these crucial choices that have become more and more topical in our sport whether it's super league whether it's your views on how financial fair play rules should work or not work it's different we have to understand we made the decision 150 years ago that our clubs were going to be essentially models of capitalism, privately owned, not members clubs. And that's always been true. I think it always will be true. I think any transition out of that would be impossible. And so people who actually own these clubs and have their um, their net worth exposed to the value of those clubs are naturally going to apply naked self-interest to the way they think about rules and regulations that apply them which is why i think we need people who aren't completely conflicted by by self-interest making those decisions